Well, thank you, everybody, and it's been an extraordinary day. Uh, we're about to begin our closing session, so I have just a few remarks before we get to the people you're all here to listen to. Um, first, uh, a special thanks to the congressional delegation that's here today. Remarkable group uh, participated throughout the day, so please give them a round of applause for being here. I got four of these, so keep the applause going. To all the uh, officials uh, from the Department of Defense, great support, participation. Thank you to the Department of Defense for being today. And amazing remarks from Secretary Mattis. Another round. <laughs> to all of you, our distinguished guests, and the amazing support from our sponsors, and most importantly, uh, to the men and women in uniform who faithfully serve. Uh, this has been a wonderful day. That's the most important applause. Uh, just a couple other notes. I really want to thank our Board of Trustees uh, from the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute, uh, whose forward-looking approach helped us not only create this wonderful forum, but now also the Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C., which I have the great privilege of, of leading. While no one does a better job of archiving and preserving uh, the president's legacy, it is the job of the Institute to promote the timeless principles that President Reagan championed. And I'm really privileged that we have the opportunity to do this in Washington, DC. A couple other thank yous, please indulge me here. Uh, first, to the Ronald Reagan National Defense Forum Executive Committee, uh, John Hybush, the Executive Director of the Foundation. Bob Cochran and Shala Seaburn do an amazing job. To the amazing Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute team, as well as the DC team at the Reagan Institute, who really were responsible for everything going well today and making it go so seamlessly, we thank you very much. Two more points. Uh, this has been uh, an amazing day, discussing all the different elements of peace through strength in an era of competition. And just to quickly note about those who will be on the stage in just a moment, I can't think of anyone better than two former CIA directors and a former national security advisor to provide us with their thoughts and insights to tell us how the United States can accomplish the most important element, in my view, of the national defense strategy, and that is how do we remain the preeminent military power in the world in this era of great power competition. So to lead us in that discussion, we are honored to have the co-anchor of Fox News, America's Newsroom. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our moderator, Bill Hammer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Great to be here. It's a, it's a high, high honor, and thank you for all being here. We have a terrific panel, no pressure, but um, <clears throat> we hope to engage you over the next hour and 10 minutes or so. <clears throat> Say hello to the former Secretary of Defense, head of the CIA, Leon Panetta. <clears throat> former National Security Advisor, retired General H.R. McMaster. <clears throat> former, former CIA Director, Mike Morrell. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Please go ahead and have a seat. Oh, we're going to get a picture real quick, guys. Get together. we got to do this. It was mandatory. <laughs> All right, right on. <clears throat> Just got to make sure I follow the rules, especially when I'm in Reagan's house. <laughs> uh, America's Newsroom, 9 a.m. to noon, Fox News Channel, tell a million people, we take all viewers. Uh, you can tweet that if you want. I've always, one of the things I love about this guy right here is that his parents not only immigrated from Italy to the United States, but they didn't choose Akron like the Morrell family, or Cincinnati like the Hemmer family. They chose Monterey, California, <laughs> and a walnut farm. You know what I call that? Good research. <laughs> well done. And Director Morrell, as a fellow Buckeye, welcome here. We can debate the northern Ohio, southern Ohio aspects later. <laughs> and to General McMaster, he has a new book coming out. It's called Battlegrounds, set for release in 2020. My query is whether that's before or after November 3rd, 2020. <laughs> it's before, but it's not what you think it's about. <laughs> you know, you could sell more books. <laughs> Some people have told me that. I've been to the Reagan Library twice in my life, and the first time I was here was the passing of Ronald Reagan. 
And the second time I'm here is the passing of George Herbert Walker Bush, number 41. And to you three gentlemen, Jennifer Griffin, Lucas Tomlinson, colleagues of mine at the Fox News Channel were talking earlier today, and, and they said, 41 stood up to Saddam Hussein first in August of 1990. But 28 years later, we are still fighting wars in that region of the world. And I just wonder, Secretary Panetta, what's the legacy of President Bush in that region, the Middle East? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. I uh, enjoy the opportunity to come back to uh, this Reagan Forum. It's really, uh, every year it becomes more successful and I wanna thank everybody associated with it. Uh, it is, uh, it's a sad day uh, with the loss of uh, President Bush. Uh, I had the opportunity in the Congress uh, to work with President Bush uh, on a number of issues. Uh, in particular, uh, I was chairman of the uh, budget, budget committee on the House side. And uh, it was President Bush that uh, had us go to uh, Andrews Air Force Base uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, to try to work on a budget agreement that would help reduce the deficit. And we did. Ultimately, that agreement plus the Clinton budget led to a balanced budget. So it was something that I was very appreciative of his leadership on that. But more importantly, I think uh, President Bush was someone who was honest, direct, truthful, believed in what America was all about, believed in our strength, and provided tremendous, tremendous leadership with regards to uh, foreign policy. He knew foreign policy. Uh, he was a great uh, director of the CIA uh, and someone that Mike and I uh, continued to recognize for his contribution to uh, intelligence. But more importantly, he was somebody who was a world leader and believed deeply in the role of the United States as a world leader. And I think the steps he took uh, in the Middle East uh, to deal with uh, what uh, Kuwait was doing uh, was the right step to take. Uh, we, uh, we were able to uh, push Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. Uh, and the president also had a great sense of when to put the brakes on in terms of uh, uh, our relationship with the Middle East in general. Uh, you know, in many ways, we continue to face controversy in the Middle East. We continue to deal with problems that were there. But I think the fact that President Bush had the strength to take, take the position he did, uh, assert United States leadership along with a, a group of allies in that whole effort, uh, I think that actually was a step in the right direction for the United States. General? Well, obviously, I've admired President Bush tremendously, and I came into the Army as a young officer uh, under, under President Reagan, and then was serving on the border uh, in Germany uh, when East Germany lifted travel restrictions to the west, and then the wall came tumbling down, a real sea change geostrategically in connection with, with American defense. Nobody could have managed that transition period better than President Bush. Uh, and and he, he laid out a very bold vision. Maybe that vision wasn't realized, but it was the right vision at the time, uh, which was an attempt to, to integrate the former Warsaw Pact countries and ultimately even Russia into a new world order. And then I had the privilege of deploying from Germany uh, to Operation Desert Storm. And his leadership was apparent there because we could clearly connect what we were doing militarily to what the objective was in that war. And it was a, a relatively narrowly circumscribed objective, right? The status quo ante. And you might recall that many people criticized President Bush after that war. Well, why didn't you go to Baghdad? Well, I think we know the answer to that now, probably, right? <laughs> but, uh, but you know, what, you know and, and, uh, and, and he, realized, he realized what we could control, but he also realized limits on the degree of agency and control we had. And he crafted an objective and a multinational effort that achieved that objective. And I felt tremendously uh, fortunate to, to have led soldiers under those conditions. And it's really the contrast between that and the difficulty of the Vietnam War, where the heroes who fought that war had a really hard time connecting the risks that they were taking and the sacrifices they were making with the achievement of an aim 
worthy of those risks and sacrifices. And that's what led me to my research on, on Vietnam. But it really all began for me in terms of recognizing what this new world order would be or trying to think about it. And then the experience I had in combat, it began with uh, President Bush and his extraordinary leadership. Oh, thank you for that. Director Morrell. You know, I worked for six presidents. Um, and I think as I look back um, that he may have been the best in terms of delivering on foreign policy, leaving the world better than what he found. Um, his time at the agency was very special. He came to the agency at a time of uh, uh, deep morale problems, and within a year he turned those around. He is beloved at CIA, so beloved that we named our compound after him. Um, and then I had a very special time with him. So in 2001, when I was President Bush 43's daily intelligence briefer, he would often join the briefing. So I would have two presidents sitting there. <laughs> um, and to hear them talk about the world was really a remarkable thing. And I remember one morning we were talking about a particularly difficult policy issue, and in the middle, Bush 41 said, you know what? I've done this before. I'm going to go play with the grandkids. <laughs> you guys take care of this problem. <laughs> I, I, I put them up for that, indeed. By, by the way, I, I, let, me, let me just add, this was a decent human being. Yes. Uh, he was somebody you could immediately relate to uh, and somebody who loved to relate to others. Uh, I'll just give you one, uh, one story. Uh, the, the chairman of the uh, committees obviously oftentimes get invited to the White House. And uh, when President Bush invited us, he invited us not just to the White House, but to his family quarters on the second floor. We had the chance to go up to the family quarters, and here were these, you know, a lot of these old cardinals who had you know, never been around before in terms of seeing the entire White House. And there was President Bush, Barbara, welcoming us to their family quarters up there. I, I, I can tell you, unlike some of the pre other presidents I've known, this guy really invested in the relationship between the president and the leadership in the Congress, and it paid off for him. Wow. You naming names today, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Not by the, you, you can file your questions on the app, and I just want to remind you about that. If they're good ones, we'll get to them in the last 10 minutes. If, if they're good ones, all right? So think about that. Uh, General McMaster, I, uh, I've been looking for a lot of comments from you over the past eight months. I didn't find many. Uh, I found a podcast, but other than that, I think you've been, I don't want to say reserved. How about quiet? I did an interview on rugby. Oh, you did? I did. I would like to hear how <laughs> what, do you, is, is life better for you on the inside or the outside of the West Wing? Well, I'll just say every day that I, that, that I served for 34 years was a privilege. And, and I would say almost especially those last 13 months as National Security Advisor. And I got to work with extraordinary people and do important work. And it, I found it immensely rewarding. So it's, a, it's a, the first time I've had a new job since I was 17. Uh, at, I'm at uh, the Hoover Institution at Stanford, and I'm loving that as well. So when I look back on it, which I've had an opportunity to do now a little bit, um, I'm, just, I'm just grateful for the opportunity. Why do you think it ended after one year? Well, I think it, it was the right time for it to end. You know? And I, I think that uh, you know, my philosophy going in from the beginning was to do my best to serve the president and the country. And when it, was, when it was time to leave, and everybody would kind of know that, the president would know that for sure. And, and um, it, it was the right time for a, a transition, I think. And I'm, could, could you name one thing that you were not able to accomplish that you wish you would have? Well, lo lots, of, lots of things, because it, it, is a, it is a complex world that, that is, I think, now manifesting a, a number of very serious challenges to national and international security. And it's very difficult to point to one thing that you just get done. And then it's finished, you, you've won that and can move on. It's a continuous interaction with determined threats, adversaries, and enemies. But I think what I'm most proud of is that we did put in place, I think, a very disciplined process that assisted the president and his cabinet in framing these challenges to national security, identifying what vital interests were at stake, viewing those challenges through the lens of those vital interests, crafting clear goals and objectives, and then engaging across our departments and agencies and with like-minded partners, allies, leaders in the private sector when that's appropriate, uh, and like-minded countries 
to, to uh, identify what we can do, how we can integrate efforts to make progress toward those objectives. We, we made a deliberate effort at restoring our strategic competence a, as a nation. And I think we were in large measure able to do that. And, and uh, it's the great work that Dr. Shadlow did, who you heard from earlier today, on the national security strategy. But, but really underpinning that unclassified national security strategy are integrated strategies that aim to advance and protect our interests in light of these, these very significant challenges. But not one thing. You, you wouldn't, you, sorry, you would not single out one individual thing that you wish you would have accomplished or succeeded or whatever word you want to use. Yeah, I, I, well, you know, of course, what we, what we emphasize is matters of urgency we've all talked about. And all of, all of those efforts are works in progress, right? We want to denuclearize North Korea. We wanted China that stops its unfair trade and economic practices, a form of economic aggression against us that is tied to what they're doing from a security perspective with predative and extractive behaviors and mercantilist policies internationally. We, we want to confront Russia's destabilizing behavior and deter further aggression in this, in this sustained campaign of disinformation and propaganda and subversion against the United States and other free and open societies uh, in the world. We want to stabilize the greater Middle East. We need an end to the Syrian civil war that addresses the humanitarian crisis, leads to the enduring defeat of ISIS, but then also limits Iranian influence uh, in, in the region. Uh, and, and, um, and we need an Iraq that's stable and, and not aligned with Iran. I think that's actually going in a pretty decent direction now. You know, we need to, you know, we need to resolve the, the, the problem set in South Asia around Afghanistan. So, None of these were going to be a one it's, one it's year a busy busy a one year. Globe. But I, mean, I, mean, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying in that long answer is there are no short term solutions to long term problems, and and what many panelists have talked about earlier today is what it requires is the integration of efforts across all departments and agencies and with like minded partners in a sustained efforts reliable from the perspective of, of our allies over time. H HR should have used uh, the quote that I used when I left Washington. I, we have a walnut farm in Carmel Valley, uh, and when I, when I uh, was announced to leave as Secretary of Defense, uh, I said, I'm going, I'm going home to work with a different set of nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you, well, one more question I want to bring in Director Morella in a, in a different category. <laughs> On Thursday morning, when the president was leaving the White House, he said he would meet with Vladimir Putin in Argentina. And when he got on board Air Force One 30 minutes later, he tweeted that the meeting was off. Just in, in your 13 months inside the West Wing, who counsels him from the helicopter to the plane to suggest we should not go forward with Putin in Argentina? How does that happen in the current context? of the Well, you know, it's, it's typically going to be the national security advisor who's with the president, right? The national security advisor is the one person in, in the foreign policy, national security realm in the administration whose only client is the president, right? Others are heads of departments or directors of agencies. And so what you owe, the, what you owe that president, I believe, is not just your opinion, but the assessment and, 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 uh, and recommendations across those departments and agencies. So that's what I try to do, very much on the, on the model of Brent Scowcroft as the honest broker to say, Mr. President, here are your options. It's always best to give a leader, I think, multiple options. I can't think of one historical experience in which less options were better for somebody. So, so, so based options. on that answer, John Bolton would have been the one who I, I would imagine, but I, I, I'm not sure, but I, I would imagine. I'm gonna talk about America's threats, and all three of you gentlemen referred to them uh, in some order here. Secretary Mattis was with my colleague, Brett Baer, a few hours ago here uh, at the Reagan Library. And he said that North Korea is the most urgent concern, Director Morrell. Uh, he was given a list of Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. And he said North Korea in terms of urgency. Do you agree? So I would say this. I'd say the, one of the defining characteristics of today um, are the number of national security threats and challenges that our country and our partners and allies face and that the President of the United States needs to pay attention to almost on a daily basis. It's a long list. You know, probably 15 to 20 things on that list. And they're all wickedly hard problems, as HR said. None of them are easy. Um, but if you were to prioritize them one to end, there would be one issue that for me is at the top of the list. And for me, there's a big gap between one and everything else. 
And that number one is China. And it is what is our relationship going to look like with China? How is it going to evolve? Because I believe that that's going to determine more than anything else <coughs> what the world is going to look like for the next 15, 20, 25, <coughs> 30 years. And it's incredibly important that we get that relationship right because the range of possible outcomes in that relationship range from cooperation on one end of the spectrum, the kind of cooperation you saw fleetingly between Obama and Xi on climate change, all the way to war on the other end of the spectrum. So we got to get this right. This is an extraordinarily difficult problem. So I think it is the most important issue. It doesn't mean we don't pay attention to those other issues. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we don't work them really hard. But that is, the, to me, the most important issue. I want to hear from both of you gentlemen. But just to complete his answer, what James Mattis said was, I would break it down in three ways. For urgency, it would be North Korea. For power, it would be Russia. For will, it would be China. Mr. Secretary, what do you think? <coughs> well, I, I, I think uh, Jim Mattis probably has it right uh, in terms of the the three at the top of the list. But it, as Michael said, look, we're dealing with a lot of flashpoints in the world today. Uh, I've never seen this many flashpoints since the end of World War II. Uh, it's not just ISIS, it's Iran, it's the, fa you know, the failing states in the Middle East, uh, it's North Korea, it's Russia, it's China, uh, it's cyber, uh, and, a, and a group of other threats as well that are out there. There are a series of very dangerous flashpoints uh, that we're dealing with in the world. And to even begin to prioritize, uh, you know, which are, which are the worst, the fact is the United States has to deal with all those flashpoints. Because similar to, you know, we just celebrated 100 years from World War I. I think the reality is, if you look at that period uh, in, in the 1916s, 1914, 1916, uh, we had a series of threats that were out there in the world. We had terrorism, territorial disputes. Uh, we had uh, fragile alliances. We, and, and we had failed leadership. And the result was that because of that, there was no capability to deal with all of these challenges, and suddenly we were in World War I. I think that's the danger today. Uh, and the reality is that we've got to have the capability to exercise leadership in every one of these areas. Yes, we have to deal with the China uh, on, a, on a geopolitical basis and because of the economic ties, et cetera. And, and obviously the president hopefully is trying to do that this evening uh, in trying to deal with the tariff issue. Uh, we've got to deal with Russia uh, in a new chapter of the Cold War with Putin. In terms of the most immediate threat, I do still worry about North Korea. Because even though there's been uh, the Singapore meeting, uh, the problem that I see is that there has not been any progress on denuclearization. And at the same time that there has been no progress, we've got North Korea, and intelligence is telling us this, are continuing to develop their nuclear capabilities, continuing to develop their missile capabilities. They're avoiding the sanctions through a number of steps. And what I worry about is a point where if North Korea is continuing to develop their missile capability, if at some point they test uh, an intercontinental ballistic missile that has some kind of, uh, you know, that can carry some kind of nuclear weapon at the top, that that will bring down in a very critical way uh, all of the groundwork that has, uh, the effort has been made to establish better relations. And I think it could create the kind of counter reaction that could immediately have us in some kind of direct conversation. Did you think, General, that North Chairman Korea. Kim would do that? Well, I think that that's a possibility, but there are a number of possibilities. The real, the real danger is what, is, is what the Secretary pointed out already, which is that they'll just continue the program. And what they're going to try to do potentially, I would think we have to at least be open to the possibility that Kim Jong-un wants to keep his nukes. And so what he would want in that, in, in, in that instance is to extract as much of a payoff from the international community as he has, as he's done in the past, get a relaxation of sanctions, maybe negotiate for a long time, get to some weak agreement that locks in the status quo as the new normal while he continues the program. So 
I think any administration that would have come in, you know, when, when, the, when President Trump came in, would have had to make some serious adjustments. If you think about it, what was our policy toward North Korea? It was strategic patience. How did that work out? It didn't work out. The, the strategy of maximum pressure has a chance. What we had said from the beginning is that what we can't do is alleviate the pressure prematurely, just based on the promise of progress. Now, it's tough to keep China on board with that. It's tough to keep South Korea on board with that, with the, the pace of the inter-Korean dialogue. But I think this is the most important aspect of that problem now, is to keep that pressure going. And I would just add quickly, the stakes are very high, not only because of an ICBM, but because you know, North Korea has never developed a weapon it didn't sell to somebody. In fact, it was developing a nuclear program for Assad in Syria. So how can we ensure that there's not going to be a proliferation problem based on him just selling weapons, maybe even to a terrorist organization? And then what happens to the nonproliferation regime? How long does it take Japan to conclude, hey, I need a weapon, or Vietnam, or Taiwan, or pick one, right? So, so I, I think this is a grave danger, and so we do have to keep our attention on it, and the emphasis ought to be on maintaining those sanctions. Kim Jong-un, but also to maintain the possibility of, of a military option. And you know, so it's not diplomacy and then war. It's diplomacy integrated with military options, with economic pressures, with diplomacy. It all has to be together. And so that's what I think we have to do is convince Kim Jong-un essentially that you're safer without them than you are with them. And, and so I, I think that's our so best chance. Two, and that two, might of not three, even work. two of three agree it's North Korea. But let me say something about North Korea, okay? Because I think it's really important to look at the problem from the other guy's perspective. It's, it's one of the jobs of the intelligence community is to tell our president how the other guy sees it, right? So how does Kim Jong-un look at this? He sees himself as having two potential paths. One path is staying on the road that he's on, which is maintaining the strategic weapons program for, to, to deter us um, primarily, but also to show his own people that he is strong. Um, stay on that path, deal with sanctions, deal with being um, bit isolated by the rest of the international community. So that's one path for him. And maybe chip, try to chip away at the sanctions as he is doing right now. He is, he is doing that right now. On enforcement, for sure. Yes. On the, on the other side, the other path that we seem to be offering him, right, Negotiate away those weapons in return for what? Um, an, an end to the Korean War, um, a opening of relations with us, um, engagement with the rest of the world, um, and a better economic future for your people. So we think that's a good deal. He does not see that as a good deal. He sees that as his death. He sees an opening to the world as his death. So when he looks at those two choices, Number one looks much better to him than number two, which is why I believe he's never going to give up these weapons. Unless now, that also looks as bad as option two. Now, yeah. I believe it is really, really important to have a conversation with him and try to negotiate away those weapons, but we should not kid ourselves on how difficult this is going to be. And, and as HR said, you've got to keep the pressure on. You have to always remember, too, I think, in the context of that conversation, what he's looking at in terms of family lineage based on his father and his grandfather. That was their well, ambition And, and as well. just quickly, too, the, the point that Mike's making and that, of course, the director understands, you always have to look at these problems from the perspective of the other, right? This is something we don't do very well a lot of times. The intelligence community does it, but a lot of times policymakers don't listen to it. And so, you know, if from, from, you know, from a North Korean perspective, are, these are now generations of brainwashing have occurred under this Juche, you know, it's sort of ideology in which they have made deprivation a badge of honor and a sign of their racial superiority. So we have to take all of this into consideration when you're, when you're looking at the, you know, at the, at the fair, various fair point. options. Fair Not a Russia. Earlier today, James Mattis called Putin a slow learner. <laughs> uh, is that the case? Or is he something else? Well, uh, I don't, I don't know that he's a, a slow learner, to be, to be truthful. I think uh, he's a bully who understands that if he reads weakness, he's going to try to take advantage of it. That's what Putin's all about. Uh, and I think he has been reading weakness uh, into the United States' position uh, 
going back a number of years, not just uh, with this president, but uh, I think the prior administration as well. And once he senses weakness uh, and that he can take advantage of it, that's exactly what he did. That's what he did in the Crimea. That's what he did in the Ukraine. That's what he did in Syria. Nobody checked him in Syria. Uh, that's what he did with the uh, cyber attacks on our election system. Uh, and the issue is going to be whether or not what he did in the Black Sea, anybody is going to check him on that uh, and take a position that he cannot simply get away with that kind of behavior. And if that doesn't happen, then he will continue to exert an aggressive approach to dealing not only with his neighbors, but with other issues as well. Mm -hmm. If you're going to deal with a bully, if you're going to deal with Putin, you have to deal with him from strength, not from weakness. You've got to make very clear to Putin where the lines are that can't be crossed. And, and frankly, if you do that, and he believes that you're going to abide by those lines, then I think you could sit down and negotiate with him. But if he doesn't believe those lines are real, then that's when you have trouble with Putin. So we have got, if we're going to approach Russia and deal with them, and we're going to have to because I think he is much more aggressive, and because I, th I do think we're in a new chapter of the Cold War, we have got to be much stronger in drawing lines with Putin. I, I, frankly, I regret that the president didn't meet with Putin. I think the opportunity at, at these G20 meetings is to sit down and, and directly confront an adversary with, with regards to the concerns that you have. That's what diplomacy is all about. And when you evade that, I think unfortunately what that does is it sends again the wrong signal to Putin. So a couple of things I think. One is uh, who is this guy? Um, and I think Bob Gates got it right. When you look in his eyes, you see KGB, KGB, KGB. He is a thug. He is a bully. Um, he only believes in relative power. How much does he have? How much do you have? He doesn't believe what everybody in this room believes, which is that it's possible to have a negotiation and end up with win-win. He only believes that it's win-lose in a negotiation. He is not the great strategic chess player that he pretends to be. He's actually a great tactician. He is a risk taker. He's an entrepreneur, but he's a particularly dangerous kind of risk taker. When he takes a risk and succeeds, he's often willing to take even a bigger risk. So whenever he does something and his mind is successful, then I worry about what comes next. So I couldn't agree more with the secretary on the importance of standing up to him. Um, that's point one, num num number one. Point, point number two is, again, from his perspective, Really important to realize that he believes, he fundamentally believes that we are trying to undermine him politically. He believes that the CIA is working every day to undermine him. Uh, he believes that the CIA caused the protests in the streets of Kiev back in 2013. Not true, not true at all, but it's what he believes and it puts in context then what he tries to do to us politically. Doesn't excuse it, but it explains it. Third point, and I think this is General Mattis's point, is by doing what he has done, he has undermined the strategic future of his own country. The only future that Russia had was an integrated economic future with Europe. And by doing what he has done since Georgia, he has, he has thrown that potential future away. So he has, he has weakened his own country and he has hurt his own people, um, and they don't understand. Mattis also said the relationship has gotten worse over the past year. I take it from that answer you probably agree with that. Absolutely. General? Well, I just say this to, rel to relate to Mike's point and the Secretary's point. Thucydides said 2,500 years ago, nations fight or engage in conflict for three fundamental reasons, fear, honor, and interest. We always talk about interest, but we don't consider fear and honor. Fear that we were behind the 2013 uprisings. Fear that he's the next color revolution. A sense of honor. If you go back to the speech he gave on New Year's Eve in, in, in 1999, New Year's Eve or the, the turn of the century, and the white paper that he wrote. He wrote in that white paper, I think it's going to take about 15 years for us to begin to compete again and to be able to regain our greatness. Guess when he 
you know, annexed Crimea, invaded Ukraine, and then a year later intervened in Syria. So he is a strategist who does what, what uh, the secretary said is, it, 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 is that he operates tactically and opportunistically, but he has a vision in mind, a vision that is based on fear and a vision that is based on the need to regain Russia's sense of honor as a, as a great power. And so over the years, it, we have tried to, you know, President Bush famously looked into his soul. You know, uh, Secretary Clinton famously brought a reset button, right? And I just say, <laughs> you know, we just have to look at the world as it is, look at him as it is, and do exactly what Secretary Panetta said. Make it clear that we are going to confront his destabilizing behavior, and we need to begin to impose costs on him well above those he factored in at the outset of, of, of the, these aggressive actions. Hmm. HR said something really, really important. Um, there is one thing this guy really fears, which is a color style revolution, an Arab Spring style movement in the streets of Moscow. He is afraid of that. He is afraid of his middle class coming out into the streets and saying, we don't like the direction our country is going. We want a greater say in how we're governed. And by the way, we want you to go away. And, and we don't agree with you. We don't agree with this aggressive foreign policy as well. And and so just a quick point on this: his approval ratings are not super reliable, as you guys know. But <laughs> but his but 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 that's, but that's true everywhere. The, by the but way. the best. <laughs> 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 but the but the but today's approval ratings for Putin are about where they were in 2013 at the same at the same time. So was the incident, you know, it, you know, against the Ukrainian Navy. I mean, was that related to his, his domestic yeah, approval ratings? It may have been, I don't, I don't know. But it can tell you, his fear, sh his fear should tell you something about how we can pressure him. On a related matter, <clears throat> General McMaster, you said the evidence is, quote, incontrovertible about interference by the Russians in the election of 2016. What, in your view, is not in dispute? Okay, so I, I think what happens with the Russian interference is a conflation of really three questions, okay? Did they do it? Did they meddle? The answer to that is, hell yes, they did, right? Everybody knows that, right? The, the second is, did they really care who won the election? I think that's still open to debate because I think Russia's had a long range of experience by this time in trying to rig elections, and they, it didn't work for them. It didn't work for them most of the time. And I think what they really were trying to achieve, above all, at least their primary objective, was to, regardless of who won, to polarize our polity, pit communities against each other, and reduce our confidence in who we are and, our, and in our democratic principles, institutions, and processes. Do you think that happened, or is that a creation on behalf of the media and America? Well, I'll tell you, I, I think it's both. And my colleague at Hoover, Neil Ferguson, has done some great work on this. He wrote a great book called The, the Tower in the Square, and he has a recent paper that will come out soon on this. You know, what they, what they did is, they, they did what they did in the Cold War. This is Moskarovka, right? Deceit, deception. Right. But now it's super-powered by social media and social media algorithms. So, hey, if you like something on social media, hey, well, you're probably gonna like this even more. And guess what? The even more is gonna be even more radical and pull you more to the right or to the left. And guess what? Russia's efforts at propaganda, disinformation, subversion increased after the election, right? So th this, this was, I think, their opportunity. I think they got what they wanted. I, I think that if you, if you look at, at our public discourse now, I mean, they're probably very happy uh, with, with the result. Oh. Look, the, you know, the, the basic problem that, you know, we're, we're, we, we haven't fully come to realize, even though bells have been going off, is that cyber warfare is the battlefield of the future. And it's going to continue to develop. And we were aware of it when we were there, uh, that uh, there were all kinds of cyber attacks that were taking place. Uh, China was using cyber to uh, take our intellectual wealth. Uh, Russia, Iran, North Korea, all using cyber to disrupt our society. And the problem is that I don't think we ever really anticipated that the kind of bold cyber attack that Russia implemented in that election uh, would really take place. I think we missed the boat 
very frankly, on that. Uh, and that when we began to find out that it was happening, that we were caught with our pants down. And rather than having some kind of, of effort to, go, to, to make the Russians know that we know and that they should back off, that there was this attitude of, well, we don't quite know, it's enmeshed, enmeshed in the election, we have to be careful about how we respond. And I think it, it again, encouraged them to continue to, uh, to implement that aggression. You know, what, what the goals were, what the purpose was, it's very basic. Russia is always trying to undermine the United States of America. Let's not kid ourselves. That's what they're about. Anything that will weaken us, anything that will have us at each other's throats, anything that will disrupt our society is what the Russians want. And they were successful at it. And I, you know, I, I will say that at least it's my sense that we are still unprepared to deal with that kind of assault. I just want to pick up on the, the, the Secretary's point about being surprised here because I think it's absolutely right. And I think this was a strategic intelligence failure. I, don't, I wasn't there at the time, so I don't know how quickly we picked it up and saw it happening. But if you go back and look at the last 10 years of DNI and Director of CIA threat, annual threat testimony every January, you know, there's always a big section on cyber. And it always talks about, you know, cyber espionage, stealing of intellectual property, risk to our critical infrastructure. There was never, ever, ever any mention about somebody weaponizing social media. We did not see this coming. There was a lack of imagination in, on this issue, not dissimilar than the lack of imagination prior to 9-11. And those, those companies grew quickly. In all fairness, right. just, the, the, the speed a, by yeah. which Facebook and Twitter yeah. and now Instagram have gained traction, that was, that was warp speed out of Silicon Valley. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Just a quick point. I mentioned Moskorovka and previous subversive efforts. One of the most important elements of political subversion and propaganda in the past was consistency of message. Right. Now, that's not the case with the Russians. Again, it goes to the overall objective of polarizing us. A new RAND study has just come out. It describes this as, as the fire hose of falsehood, right? And, and I think that's what they, they really want to just pull us apart as Americans. And, and I think we have an opportunity. And in Congress, I, I met with my counterpart, and I tried to just turn it on him. So you, you guys think you're winning in this? You're losing. The only thing our Congress can really agree on overwhelmingly is to sanction you. You know, <laughs> because of this. And, uh, and so I think there is an opportunity for us to, to come together, to recognize this threat and work together in a, in a nonpartisan, bipartisan okay. way. Okay, Saudi Arabia. What do you do about Saudi Arabia, the relationship, et cetera? Secretary Pompeo made the case on Capitol Hill this week that the Middle East is filled with bad actors. Uh, he wrote in the Wall Street Journal this past week on Wednesday. I'm just taking one sentence for two sentences from that piece. He writes, the kingdom is a powerful force for stability in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia is working to secure Iraq's fragile democracy and keep Baghdad tethered to the West's interests and not Tehran's. Those sentences say a lot um, about the strategy on behalf of this administration um, and what they would like to see in terms of development in that part of the world. How do you find a balance, Mr. Secretary, in dealing with these relationships that you know are less than perfect? Well, that's what diplomacy is all about, for God's sakes. Uh, you, there is, you don't have a choice here uh, between destroying the relationship or doing nothing. It's about balance. It's about how do you approach this, uh, uphold the values that we think are very important. This country has always had a set of values that relate to human dignity, to the rule of law to how we treat people that go to the core of what the United States is all about. That's been the core of our ability to provide leadership in the world. And when it's clear that Saudi Arabia did what they did in this horrendous murder, you've got to make very clear to the Saudis, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I just think it's really important for the president 
to work with the Congress to develop the kind of targeted sanctions that send a message that this kind of behavior is unacceptable. It doesn't have to undermine our relationship with Saudi Arabia. Frankly, we'd get a hell of a lot more respect if we made that clear. We'll continue to work with you. We'll continue to be cooperative with you. But we cannot tolerate this kind of behavior. That's the way the United States is supposed to act. Not to run from this case, not to say, oh my God, we're so dependent on this relationship that we're not even going to pay attention to this murder. We can't do that or we undermine our position in the world. So there's a way to do this that frankly balances both of these objectives. But right now, I get, you know, I get this sense of that the Congress is going to do what they want to do uh, in order to send a message, and the president's not going to pay attention to it uh, for whatever reason. And all of that sends exactly the wrong message to the world about what the hell the United States stands for. Well, what Congress and the Senate has done is they, they've voted to two to one to take the funding away to Saudi Arabia yeah, yeah. Um, in the war they're fighting against Yemen. General Mattis was asked about that today with, with Brett, as I mentioned earlier today. He talked about accountability. Yeah. And he also talked about a counter to Iran. He said, we need to do both. And acting with Yemen is in our best interest. We need to protect this country. And that's his position. Do we know, General, if the message that Secretary Panetta is relaying to us today if that has been relayed to the kingdom? Well, I, I don't for sure. I'm, I'm, in, I'm at Stanford now. <laughs> That's you know? right. So, so <laughs> you're working with a different set of nuts. <laughs> but uh, but, but I, I, I think that this is the kind of message that has to go to the, to, to the Saudis, but other partners in the region. It, it, to clarify, what are our expectations, really? What, we, I want to highlight the importance of the relationship, but also make clear what our expectations ought to be of each other. So, the, so with the Saudis, with the Emiratis, other sort of like-minded countries in connection with the Iranian threat, we all need to do more. Of course, everybody's very troubled about this horrible murder. We ought to also be troubled about why is Saudi Arabia buying S-400 missiles from Russia? Why is, uh, why is the crown prince, you know, high-fiving with Vladimir Putin when the Russians are the key enablers of Iran in the region? I mean, if, if Saudi Arabia, UAE, others are really concerned about Iran, Iran's role in the region, why aren't they imposing more costs on the Russians for being Iran's prime sponsor? So I think there are a lot, there are a lot of conversations we can have about expectations. Their expectation of us is that we be more reliable. They believe that under the last administration, that that administration saw our disengagement from the Middle East as an unmitigated good and contributed to the humanitarian and political catastrophe that centered on the Syrian civil war and then actually enabled Iran across the region with the JCPOA, who did not do what it was assumed they would do, which is once the JCPOA has signed the Iran nuclear deal, that Iran would moderate their behavior. They did the opposite, and they took the payoff that they got, and they took all the, you know, the, the, the promised future revenue with letters of agreement and contracts to actually up the budget of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps and to strengthen the control that the clerical order has on the country. And so it demanded a change in strategy, but I think that the reason why our Gulf partners, and Mike, I'd be interested to know what you, what you think about this, one of the reasons they're hedging with Russia is they don't think we're reliable in the long term. They think they're gonna get another administration that says, hey, you know, the Middle East, forget it, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna disengage. I think that's their perspective. Again, this is yeah. put, your, put yourself in the, in the perspective of the other. So, so they're afraid of two things, right? They're afraid of that slow American withdrawal from the Middle East, which they saw, which they thought they saw in the Obama administration. And then there's something else they really fear, which is that the United States will eventually come to see Iran, maybe a different kind of Iran than we have today, but will eventually come to see Iran as a better strategic partner in the Middle East than the Sunni Arabs. They are scared to death of that. And we kind of sent them that message with the JCPOA. And doing secret, ne secret negotiations with the Iranians without telling them. That was a big deal. But I want to say something about, about MBS, OK? Um, there's a, on the one hand and on the other hand here. On the one hand, he is the only Saudi that I have ever talked to. And he is the only Saudi that I have ever seen who understands that they need to reform their economy their society and their religion 
if they are going to save that nation from going off the cliff. On the other hand, he is young, he is impulsive, he is paranoid, he doesn't listen, he's got only a small circle of advisors, all of them young, nobody with gray hair around him, and he has or a no, string, no <laughs> a string of bad judgment calls from Yemen to Qatar to kidnapping the Lebanese prime minister to locking up a bunch of businessmen to the Khashoggi issue to putting women in jail who were advocating for a policy that he actually put in place, a string of bad judgments. So at the end of the day, whether this guy is actually going to end up being the Ataturk of Saudi Arabia, the father of a modern Saudi Arabia, or whether he's going to end up being the Gorbachev of Saudi Arabia, the guy who actually takes them off the cliff, is an open question. Uh, no, well, so none of you is saying that we should withdraw a relationship with Saudi Arabia. Um, General, the first trip for this administration overseas was Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um, did they embrace it? perhaps in the right way, or did they get too close too quickly? Well, I mean, I think that it's not the United States that is, is fundamentally responsible for the, for the behavior of, of the regime and whoever made the decisions in, in this brutal murder. The, you're right, though, that the beginning, though, of the relationship was one of tremendous promise. I mean, a tremendous promise that, as Mike was saying, we would want to realize. I think that Riyadh trip was, 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 uh, was a, a tremendous success for a number of reasons, but the number one reason for me was there was an explicit recognition on the part of King Salman and all those there that Saudi Arabia had created a monster beginning in the 1970s with the propagation of the Salafi jihadist takfirist ideology. And, and that, and, and that there, there had to be a fundamental correction to that. And we had to work together, not just anymore, against designated terrorist organizations, but against extremists who are, were propagating in extremist mosques and madrasas this message that it's okay to, to, to murder those that fall outside of your narrow definition of Islam, or at least begin to create the, pipe, the pipeline to that. And so there was concrete progress, at least in gaining assurances of working together on the ideology and working together on the finance, the financial flows to these extremist groups. And we have made some progress in, bo in both areas. If you take King Salman's speech and you put it up next to President Trump's, I mean, it, it's, it's striking. You, no one would ever have thought that a, a king of Saudi Arabia would have said what he said in, in the context of that, con that conference. The key is, can we regain that momentum now and, and to achieve the, the, the kind of progress, not just internal to Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia helped create a global problem but to enlist Saudi Arabia in trying to address that global problem. Yeah. Let's Look, talk those, about those are those are all important issues, but the reality is we know what happened in that consulate in Turkey. We know it. Now I know there's been this argument. Well, there's no smoking gun. There are a hell of a lot of people in prison where there wasn't some smoking gun because you had overwhelming evidence of a crime being committed. And in this instance, there's overwhelming evidence, not only by the CIA, but by Turkey and all of those that have looked at this issue. Rather than try to somehow excuse that evidence, I mean, the President of the United States ought to accept the presentation that was made by the CIA, that the high degree of confidence, you know, we think uh, the Crown Prince was involved in this issue, and then use that as a way to say, we're going to take steps to make very clear that this behavior is unacceptable, and at the same time recognize that it is important to work with Saudi Arabia in terms of dealing with the issues in the Middle East. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. That's not a problem. Other presidents have done that. When we've had to send a clear message to, uh, to an ally that they screwed up, We've done that, but they remain allies because we continue the relationship. And we can do that here. This is not an, a, an all or nothing situation. I want to touch on three more areas and then hopefully we'll get some questions from um, 
some of the folks here in the audience today, the Reagan Library. Military budget, kind of a big turn here, fellows, but um, there was a debate whether it's $733 billion or a reduction to $700 billion two years from now. I, I heard a gentleman earlier today say, how do you know the right number? How do you know the right number? Well, I mean, yeah, look. <laughs> The right, What's the, right the, right, the right number from the defense point of view is always more uh, because that's, that's the way, you know, uh, Defense Department approaches these things and, and why not. Uh, the, the problem is, and, and look, I, I, I support funding for our Defense Department. I think we've got to maintain uh, a, a defense that, uh, that is the strongest military on the face of the earth. That's what we are. And we have to continue to do that. But I also don't think we ought to kid ourselves that there is a real danger lurking in the out years. And it is the debt. It's a $20 trillion debt that is going to expand even more in these next 10 years. We're, we are now at a point where we are approaching a trillion dollar annual deficit that's going to eat us up alive in terms of interest payments. It's going to diminish our resources for the future. And at some point, it's going to blow up our economy. Now, do we face that now and pretend that, oh, my God, we'll have all of this money in the future and just pass it on to the future uh, to blow up at, at, for our children? Or are we going to confront that now? That's the real challenge. And, and the reality is, look, Republicans, Democrats, President Trump, nobody wants to confront this issue. Nobody wants to confront it. Nobody's talking about what you have to do to deal with that kind of deficit. Why? Because it's tough politically. You've got to deal with entitlements. You have to deal with discretionary spending. You've got to deal with defense. You have to deal with taxes if you're serious about doing it, if you want to deal with it. But nobody has the leadership to deal with that issue. And so we're playing this game of basically kind of hoping that we can continue to borrow the money uh, in the future to try to do it. What we need to do is to have a comprehensive budget agreement that begins to reduce the deficit and then allows the Defense Department and everybody else to have some sense of certainty about what that budget is going to look like. Rather than raising it now, only to have to tear it down in the future, which is the worst thing you can do in the defense budget. Yeah. It's a national security issue, too, what you described there with the debt. Gentlemen, do you have an answer as to what the right number is? So I was going to say I know what the CIA budget is, but it's classified. <laughs> <laughs> General? I'd just like to say that uh, there's a relationship between technological capability and what our technological capabilities have allowed us to do uh, really since World War I, to go back to World War I, uh, and, and what our enemies have done, our potential adversary enemies and our adversaries have done, which is develop niche and disruptive technologies that take apart what they see as our technological differential advantages. If you think about it, since World War I, smaller and smaller forces have had a bigger and bigger impact over wider areas. I think that relationship is changing fundamentally due to counter-satellite capabilities, offensive cyber capabilities and electronic warfare that go after precision navigation and timing, that will go after our ability for imagery, will go after our assured communication, our ability really to conduct effective joint operations. Uh, and, and so I think that now the size of the force is, is, is more important. And what we have done over the years is cut the size of our force back so we can save money to apply to exquisite weapon systems, which I think are now prone to catastrophic failure. And the path we were on was to invest more and more in more and more exquisite weapons, which I think could lead to exquisite irrelevance in future war. Yeah. And so what we need is we need different systems that are less expensive, this is where industry can help tremendously, that degrade gracefully and don't depend on exquisite communications and, and have redundancy in systems. And we have to figure out a way, I think, to grow depth in, in our force. And, and that's the, the land, 
uh, air and naval forces. And, and I, I, think that, I think that this is something that has not received enough attention, is capacity, the size of the forces. Yeah. Uh, quickly on this, I, it's a big question, but I just want to go through all three of you quickly, then we're going to move to some audience questions here. What Mattis said earlier today about the Trump legacy is that 15 years from now, we will be judged by whether or not we were able to create a new way to interact with China. It's a very interesting phrase. It probably wasn't the answer I was expecting, but Director Morell, you mentioned China, not North Korea is the number one urgency. And uh, General McMaster, I know you've done, you've been quite vocal about uh, the Chinese government and what our relationship should and should not be with them in terms of technology, information sharing, et cetera. Is he right 15 years from now that how well they do perhaps on the trade deal they're negotiating at the moment, whether or not they can make gains in intellectual property and get that under control for the future, perhaps 15 years from now, if you, if you stabilize that relationship around this time, that the legacy of this administration will be judged on that. Yeah. What do you think? Well, you want to go first? No, go please. Well, I would just say that we shouldn't care about as much about the relationship as we do about our interests vis-a-vis -vis China and how we advance our interests. We've had, the, we've had the illusion of good relations with China while they've been taking advantage of us, taking advantage of us not competing as they applied unfair trade and economic practices, as they stole intellectual property or forced the transfer of intellectual property, as they financed projects throughout, you know, throughout the world uh, well uh, below rates that the market would bear and then trade debt for equity and take over that infrastructure, where they coerce countries and companies to adopt their view of the world, while they now, to maintain the Chinese Communist Party's grip on power, have incarcerated in concentration camps a million people, are creating the true Orwellian uh, surveillance state. And, and so we have, to, we have to recognize that we have to compete against a different system that is offering a different vision to the world. And this has to be our free and open societies working together, not just on tariffs, not just on you know, trade policy, but on the broad range of issues. And the question is, again, going back to what, are the, what is the Chinese Communist Party, President Xi perspective. We have policy issues, but these might be structural because the mandate of the Chinese Communist Party in, 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 in the, in the, in the post-ideological, communist ideological period, has substituted nationalism and China taking center stage again, if you quote from, from Xi's speech. And for the party to maintain their grip on power, they have to prioritize state enterprises, which are inherently unfair. And they're, and they're prioritizing this civil-military fusion in a way that is structural and isn't just going to it result in a change of policy. So I think we need a sustained strategy of competition. Do you think they can win in this negotiation? Or are they going to fight to withdraw? To, to withdraw from the... To a draw. To, you know, I, I think it's, there's not going to be a win in this. I think there's going to be a sustained competition for, for a long time. And, and, um, and I think what we have to do with like-minded countries, the other free and open societies of the world, and with industry, is say, do you really want to do business with them? You might make a profit in the short term, but you're, you know, you're signing your own death sentence in the long term because they're going to steal your intellectual property and they're going to use it at, to produce products at below market rates and dump them into your economy and the world market and run you out of business. And so what we have to do is we have to say, who do you want as a trusted partner? We, get, we have to do a much better job at this. You know, this, is what, this is what doing business with China looks like. This is what doing business with us looks like. I mean, look at South Korea. Look at what South Korea was in 1953 and what they are today. We ought to hold that up as a badge of honor. This is what you get when you work with the United States. No, no, look, let, let me, let me I, I, think, I think the legacy of this administration uh, is not going to rest uh, with China. In part, it will. I think, I think the larger question is going to be with, with an, in, an administration that has used chaos to deal with a number of areas, whether it's you know, pulling out of the TTP, or whether it's the climate change issue, or whether it's tariffs, or whether it's Iran, pulling out of the Iran agreement, uh, all of which, and, and now the tariffs on, on China, all of which are chaotic in the approach, and I, 
a certain amount of chaos sometimes makes sense. But the real problem in my mind is going to be whether or not the administration in view of this chaos is going to develop a long-term strategy for where it wants to go in all of these issues. All of these issues. Not just China, but all of these issues. What is our long-range strategy to ultimately deal with Iran and the situation in Iran? What is our long-term strategy to deal with trade uh, and uh, with a global world, which it is? What is our, 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 our long-term strategy going to be uh, in terms of dealing with issues like, like the debt? I mean, those are the questions that I think will determine the future of this administration's place in history, is whether or not we are going to be left with chaos or whether or not this administration is ultimately going to figure out strategic goals and strategies that will deliver on trying to produce a more stable world. I just wanted to come back to China to say that the reason this competition that HR talked about is so important is because if they become the leader of, in the world and begin to replace us, two bad things happen. Does, is there anybody here who believes that the Chinese will treat the rest of the world any better than they treat their own people? And you can already see examples of it in the places where they spend a lot of time. And two, as HR said, they are aggressively out there selling their model, their model of managed capitalism and their model of authoritarianism. And the more they lead, the more they will be successful at selling those two models. That's why this competition is so critical. Well, great and, answer. And, and uh, the way you, the only way to win it, yep. I know you want to move on, I can tell. The only way you win it, <laughs> the only way you win it is with a coalition of nations together the Chinese will pay attention. Yeah, great. My, my job is to keep the plate spinning, yep. though. I got right? you. Yeah. You, you. You understand that, right? I got it. Okay. A um, couple great questions here, too. I want to get to all three of them. But I guess the one last question I had was, you know, I mean, we talk a lot about public service when we reflect on President Reagan, especially today with President Bush and his passing last night. You know, what was the one thing that you thought, what was the hardest part about your job that you wanted the public to understand? Maybe you couldn't communicate or maybe you couldn't get them to understand. Well, I mean, when you're sitting on the beach in Carmel, I mean, <laughs> certainly there, there's got to be something that, man, I've tried to do this, but I just, I just kept bumping into this or that or the other or said person. And, and if people uh, could see that from my eyes, maybe they would understand or appreciate perhaps the job you did. No, I, look, I, I, think, I think the toughest part of... Uh, of the jobs, uh, you know, within any administration. Uh, the toughest part of the job is the ability to speak the truth to power. Uh, and that's the toughest thing uh, that, and the toughest problem that people have. Uh, and I've seen this in the White House, that ultimately people refrain from really speaking the truth to the president because they're afraid of doing it. And so they don't. Uh, and that is, frankly, one of the biggest problems. Uh, I think it's important to speak the truth to the president and to anybody else. I think that it's important that you say what you think in terms of policy uh, and what needs to be done. Uh, the president has the right to make the decision. He's the person, president's the one who's elected to make those decisions. But you, as somebody who operates, whether it's in the White House or in the administration, in any capacity, you have to have the courage to be able to say, you're wrong, Mr. President, this is what needs to be done. Question number one, a General McMaster from the audience, what should be the end game strategy in Afghanistan? How is that different from what we've been doing the last 18 years. Yeah. Well, we haven't had an 18-year strategy in Afghanistan. We've had, you know, 18, one year or 17, at least one-year strategies. I think if you had set out to screw up Afghanistan, <laughs> uh, you wouldn't have done anything worse than what we did over the years. So, um, obviously, it's, it's a very difficult problem. 
Uh, the course of events there depended not just on what we did, obviously, but on determined, brutal, murderous enemies, right, who have a say in the future course of events. And what's required in Afghanistan is to try to achieve an outcome that's, that's worthy of our effort, that is connected to our vital interests, and that's to ensure that transnational terrorist organizations who want to kill our children don't gain access to territory resources and population and use that to plan, resource, organize, and then conduct those attacks. So what Afghanistan needs to be to be able to do that, to deny that safe hands, it needs to be Afghanistan. It doesn't need to be Switzerland. It needs to be Afghanistan. And so it's really going to take four fundamental things. First, it's going to take the, the, the internal communities of Afghanistan coming together around a vision for the country in which they believe their interests will be advanced and protected. The second thing it will take is, a, is regional uh, powers playing a less destructive role or a more productive role. This is Pakistan in particular. One of the things that's different about the strategy now is that the policy toward Pakistan is you can't have it both ways anymore. We, you can't act like you're a major non-NATO ally and receive you know, the, be the benefits of our largesse and then kill our soldiers and, com and help facilitate mass murder attacks in Afghanistan by the use of, of, of proxies and, and groups that you don't go after because you only go after these groups selectively. The third thing that has to happen is Afghanistan has to be hardened, strengthened against the regenerative capacity of the Taliban, which lies across the border in Pakistan. There's been some progress made, but it's tough, and Afghans are taking too many casualties to sustain. So that has to be better. And then the, the fourth thing is there has to be sustained international commitment. When, when I came into this job, the Afghanistan strategy was not only ineffective, I would say it was unethical. And the reason it was ineffective is because it neglected the fact that war is a contest of wills. As the previous administration sent troops to Afghanistan, they announced their withdrawal the same day. How does that work? I thought in war, winning means convincing your enemy your enemy's been defeated, or in this case, to get a deal with the Taliban, to convince them they can't accomplish their objectives through violence. And then we, we negotiated with them to cut a deal. As we said, we're leaving, and, and that they're making battlefield gains. How does that work? It was, it was completely disconnected what we were doing militarily from what we said we wanted to achieve politically. We, we created all these myths. We drew a bold line between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. There's no bold line between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Osama bin Laden's son is commanding a Taliban unit. Shorebach Farms when you were there. there. I mean, it was, it's a Taliban training center set up for Al-Qaeda. So we created a whole mythology about the world. We didn't, even, we didn't even explain it to the American people to generate our will in this contest of wills. And the reason I said it's unethical is Thomas Aquinas said one of the tuss, tests for a just war is that you have a just end in mind. It wasn't really even defined, I don't think. And certainly we weren't doing anything to achieve it. So what were our soldiers dying for? I mean, was it just? So I think now the strategy is designed to get to a sustainable outcome. The, the arbitrary time limit was lifted, right, which was a key element of integrating what you're doing militarily right. with what you want to try to achieve politically. And so it is a fundamentally different approach. I think go back to that August speech the president made. I think it really lays out the strategy clearly. Now, will we stick to it? Will we have the will, right? I mean, the question people ask, can you win in Afghanistan? Yes, you can win. You can get to a sustainable outcome consistent with your vital interests. The question is, can we win there at a cost acceptable to the American public? I think we can. At the height of the war, $112 billion a year. Now it is $22 billion a year, and it could go down further with more burden sharing. At the height of the war, what, 120,000 U.S. troops, or 115, and 100, 160 total uh, with the coalition, now down to 14,000 U.S. troops. Do the troop numbers matter? I don't think they should, but it, I believe it's a level of effort that is sustainable and that is consistent with our vital interests. And, and just consider what happens if Afghanistan would collapse, which I don't think they would, but if Afghanistan would collapse. Think of the physical threat, but think about the psychological threat of these terrorist organizations who say we defeated the United States, NATO, and the West. Now think about them with access to the narcotics trade and the riches associated with that and what they can do to destabilize the region, including Pakistan, a country with nuclear weapons. So I, I believe it's in our interest to sustain this effort, and I believe we do now have a strategy in place that, uh, that can achieve that outcome in the long term. Question number two, and I'm afraid this is going to be the last question. We're running out of time. Then Roger's going to have some closing remarks up here in a moment. 
the question is this. Uh, Americans under the age of 30 today grew up without the historic experience of the Cold War or major great power competition. Do you think that has impacted how our next generation views national security and America's role in the world, and if so, how? And I guess, Director Morell, you can start here. I would, I would add to that 9-11 notwithstanding. So here's what I would say. I spend a lot of time on college campuses. I spend a lot of time talking to kids who are interested in national security. This is not a difficult conversation with them. They understand it. Amen. I, uh, I think that we've got to have a, a different approach uh, in terms of really letting young people understand that they owe something back to the country. Uh, and I realize that, you know, there was debate about uh, Jim Mattis men mentioned the draft and what have you, and I understand the, the concerns about that. But I really do think in this country we have got to think seriously about a national service system that requires every young person to give two years of their life to this country in some capacity, whether it's to the military, education, conservation, I don't give a damn what, it, what that is. But we need to go back and have, pe and have young people understand that they owe something back to this country and they have a responsibility to give back to this country. Gentlemen, thank you. I knew it would be the best panel of the day. Leon <laughs> Panetta, H.R. McMaster, Mike Morrell. Thank you. Thank you. Roger. Thank you, buddy. Great to be with you.